Hello YouTube. In this video, I'm going to introduce some of the ideas of Max Stirner. Uh, I do already have a couple of videos on Stirner, which I will link in the comments below. Uh, however, one very interesting aspect of his work that I didn't cover in those videos is his account of the self. And really, this is of central importance for Stirner. Uh, it's expressed in the title of his book. It was originally translated The Ego and His Own, but the more accurate translation is the unique and its property. So that's what I will be talking about today. What exactly is the unique? Uh, now before getting into this, I do need to state the caveat. Stirner's work is open to a lot of different interpretations. I am presenting this merely as one, perhaps idiosyncratic, view of Stirner. Uh, I make no claim that this is the definitive account of what Stirner really meant. Okay, so the unique and its property. An intuitive way to think about what Stirner is doing here is that he's giving an analysis of the self. The phrase, the unique, that refers to the self. But a crucial point is that this, this term unique, it has no content. It's merely a label for something indefinable. So when somebody introduces a new term, they would usually try to define it. They would say, you know, this is what the term means. They would give content to it. The whole point of introducing this phrase, the unique, is that what it's pointing to cannot be defined. The unique is used to label something that has no definition. We can think of the unique as being like a name. A name merely labels something, it doesn't define what the thing is. When I use the name Verity, I merely label a particular person or I, I point to a particular person. I don't communicate anything about that person. I don't tell you what their properties are. In fact, uh, it might not even be a person. Verity could be the name of a town or a star or a piece of medical equipment or anything. So names have no content, they just point at things. Stirner's phrase, the unique, works in the same way. It's a label. Now, when I talk about the unique, what I'm labelling is myself, me, the thing that I am. So, what am, what am I? <laughs> what am I? Well, Stirner's point is that any description that I give of myself, any property that I attribute to myself, will fail to capture what I am. I might say, I'm a philosopher. Well, you know, being a philosopher is not essential to my identity. I sometimes do philosophy. Very often I don't do philosophy. Very often I'm doing something else. I could stop doing philosophy entirely and I would still be me. Or I might say, I am a man. But what is a man? Right now we need a definition of man. Aristotle held that man is a rational animal. The essence of man is rationality. For Descartes, the essence of man was the thinking mind, cognition. Well, yes, I engage in rational thought sometimes, but then sometimes I don't. When I'm daydreaming, I'm still me, even when I'm, I mean, and even when I am engaging in rational thought, you know, it's, it's my thought, it's not shared with other people, it's unique. The self cannot be identified with any of its properties. So yes, I am a man, but I'm many other things too. I'm an animal, I'm a philosopher, I'm a Briton. Each of these concepts, man, animal, philosopher, Briton, has conceptual content that is defined independently of me. None of these properties is essential to me, and I am more than any of these things. Of course, it's, you know, like, I am, um, I am part of the extension of the term man, so we can say that the concept man correctly applies to me, but that's only as a result of features of my body or my mind that are taken to be shared with everyone else, every other human being. If you ask, like, who is the owner of these features, right, who, who is the, who is the thing that bears these features? Well, that is completely unique. Uh, so man cannot express who I am, partly because it can't distinguish me from other men, from other human beings, partly because the content of man, the properties that it picks out, are not essential to me. In principle, I could lose all of those properties and still be me. Like, I might, for instance, take on a transhumanist project. Okay, maybe in the future I will modify myself with technology and I won't even be a biological organism anymore, but I'll still be me. Um, so, in a way, what, what Stirner's doing here might be seen as a sort of extension of um, David Hume's famous argument against the self. Hume similarly asks the question, what is the self, right? So we, I, I notice that I have 
various properties and I do various things, but what is it that's me? What is the thing that persists through these changes, right? When I say like, I am the same person that I was five years ago, what is, what is that thing that is the same over those five years? Well, Hume's answer is, there's nothing. Um, I mean, so obviously the self is not any part of the body because I could lose any particular bodily part and I would still be me. I could chop off my hands or I could cut out my heart. I guess I'd have to replace it with an artificial heart, but I'd still be me, I'd still be the same person. So all of the bodily parts, that's not me, that's not myself. Or I, I could look into the mind, I can introspect. Well, if you introspect, notice that what you find is this ever-changing bundle of mental impressions. There are feelings, thoughts, emotions, mental images. So right now, for me, um, okay, there are visual impressions of various colours. Uh, there's a pang of hunger. I haven't, you know, haven't eaten since this morning. Uh, there's the feeling of the clothes against my skin. So there's all of these different mental impressions. But there's nothing that that unifies the, all of this, and there's nothing that persists through this ever-changing flux of mental impressions. When I look inside my mind, I find no persisting self. Like anything that I point to in my, in my body or my mind, right, none of that is a persisting self. So, so Hume's conclusion is there just is no self, it's an illusion. Or well, Stirner is making a similar point, but with respect to the concepts that we use to classify people. Any concept that I use to describe my characteristics or properties cannot be taken as describing anything essential to my identity. It cannot describe me. I am indefinable. When Stirner uses the term unique, it's a label for this indefinable thing. We can point to it, but we cannot say it, we cannot describe it. Um, in his article, Stirner's Critics, Stirner summarizes it as follows. He says, only when nothing is said about you and you are merely named, are you recognized as you. As soon as something is said about you, you are only recognized as that thing, human, spirit, Christian, etc. But the unique doesn't say anything because it is merely a name. It says only that you are you and nothing but you, that you are a unique you, or rather yourself. Therefore you have no attribute, but with this you are at the same time without determination, vocation, laws, etc. Uh, similarly, Stirner says, what Stirner says is a word, a thought, a concept. What he means is neither a word, nor a thought, nor a concept. What he says is not the meaning and what he means cannot be said. Um, in that quote, Stirner is talking in the third person for some reason. Uh, okay, what is the unique and its property? Well, the basic idea is very simple. There is the self, and then the self has various properties. There is the self, and there's the things that the self has, or the things that it does. But the point of this term unique is that the self cannot be described, it cannot be identified with any property. What is the self? It's nothing. That's why no descriptive term can apply. Uh, so I, I use a term like you know, human being, or mind, or personality, or philosopher, or Christian. Right, any term you like. These terms have content. To describe something as a human being or to describe its personality is to provide a great deal of information about that thing. You cannot provide information about the unique. There's no information to provide. The unique is nothing. The unique has no essence. Any description of the unique is just false. Anything I attribute to it, anything I take to be part of its identity is false. Why? Well, because there are only those things that the unique takes to be its property. There are only those roles that it plays. Uh, there are only those things that are mine or those actions that I perform. What is, the, what is the I, what is the self that asserts ownership of these things or that performs these actions? Nothing. So is this just a sort of Humean denial of the self? Well, not really. Stirner has quite a lot more to say. The key point is that nothingness is creative. The fact that I am nothing creates a radical freedom. It allows me to affirm any number of properties and roles, to you know, play any number of roles. I can take anything as my property, I can play any kind of role. Since I am nothing, since I have no essence, nothing is excluded from me. So think about my hands. My hands are not me, but of course I can take them as mine. This is an act of appropriation. 
Things become mine when I appropriate them, when I affirm ownership or power over them. I affirm ownership of my hands and I use them as, as, as I want, right? And the same goes for the rest of my body and for all of the mental content, you know, the thoughts, emotions, experiences, all of these are mine, right? Now, it's these acts of appropriation that sort of, you know, through which the unique manifests itself, you know? So, um, you know, th through which we might say the self is constructed. Now, when something is appropriated, when it becomes mine, that seems to presuppose that there must be some thing, some entity that is the bearer of all of these properties. Now, of course, in fact, there is no such thing that bears all of these properties. There's only the acts of appropriation. And these acts of appropriation are completely free and unrestricted. Nothing is creative. Nothing allows me to take on any property, any role as my own. As Stirner says, I am not nothing in the sense of emptiness, but I am the creative nothing, the nothing out of which I myself create everything as creator. Because I am nothing, I am free to make any appropriative act. Suppose that the self were definable, right? So take, for instance, Descartes' idea that the essence of mankind is mind or thought. Well, this supposes that there is a limit on appropriative acts. On the Cartesian view, I am an incorporeal mind contained within a material body. So I'm appropriating the mind, but not the body. The body is not mine, it simply contains me. The Carte so yes, yeah, it's, it's appropriating the mind, not the body. On Stirner's view, I'm nothing. So everything is open to appropriation. Um, as Stirner says, no one lives in any world other than his own. Everyone is the center of his own world. World is only what he himself is not, but what belongs to him is in a relationship with him, exists for him. To say that the whole world is my property is to say that I may appropriate any of it. I'm not bound by anything. Indeed, I'm not even bound by the choices I made in the past. It's quite Stirner. As you, are at each, at each, as you are at each instant, you are your own creation. And now in this creation, you don't want to lose yourself, the creator. So with each moment, you know, I, I get away from myself and create myself anew. So one point that Stirner makes is that the nothingness of the self entails a radical freedom of self-construction. Uh, he departs from Hume in another way also. Hume's argument treats the bundle of physical and mental states as given. Uh, so Hume says when we look for the self we find only particular bodily parts and mental impressions and nothing that unifies them or that persists over time. So the bodily parts and mental impressions are taken for granted, right? And then the self is an illusion arising from them. Okay, so th th these, these, uh, these parts exist independently and then the illusion of the self arises from their activity. But on Stirner's view, there is an interdependence between the unique and its property. One cannot exist independent of the other. Uh, each brings the other into existence out of nothingness. So it's fairly obvious how the unique is dependent on its property. The unique acts through appropriating property. But of course, any act can be, any like appropriation can be performed only with capacities that are initially taken as property. So my voice, my thoughts, my desires, my will, my, you know, I don't know, say a written word or something like that. Um, again, none of these is me, right? All of these are my property. Since the unique is nothing, in the absence of any appropriative act, there would be nothing to label unique, right? The unique manifests through its property. Uh, so Stirner says, everything turns around you. You are the center of the outer world and of the thought world. Your world extends as far as your capacity and what you grasp is your own simply because you grasp it. You, the unique, are the unique only together with your property. Similarly, he says, my power is my property. My power gives me property. My power am I myself, and through it am I my property. So you have like the, the unique, right? It, it manifests by appropriating property, but the appropriation occurs only with capacities that are already taken as property, right? So you, the unique is dependent on, the pro on property. But similarly, the property depends on the unique. None of the things that might be appropriated by the unique are as it were, given to us, that none of these things exist independently. 
Instead, the unique creates them through uh, constructive and appropriative acts. Uh, the way that Stoner puts this is to say that everything is unique in just the same way that I am unique. So here's an example. I look out of my window and I see a tree. What exactly is this tree? Well, notice that tree is a concept. We use it to simplify and systematize our experience. But it doesn't really, I mean, so there's, so this concept doesn't truly apply or it doesn't really apply to any given object that I might come into contact with for a couple of reasons. So first of all, the tree outside my window is in constant flux, right? It's constantly changing. If you take any one of its properties, its size, its shape, its color, it could lose any of these properties and yet we might well treat it as the same object. Indeed, if you look at a tree over time, it grows from an acorn. Well, an acorn and a tree, they have completely different properties and yet it's the same thing over time that's, that's changing. So just in the same way that I, you know, I could lose my hands or I could lose, I could stop engaging in rational thought, I would still be me. Well, in the same way that object out there, <laughs> it would still be it, you know, it would still be the same object, even though it has, you know, you know, lost any number of its properties or changed any number of its properties. Second, all trees are different. The concept tree does not label any particular tree and was not created with reference to any particular tree. It can't distinguish any particular tree from any other tree. If we uh, associate the concept tree with a definition with a set of necessary and sufficient conditions, it will be false of some trees. So, you know, when I describe an object as a tree, well, sure, that object may exhibit properties that we associate with trees, but this isn't going to describe the essence of the object. It doesn't describe what the object is. When I describe something as a tree, this fails to articulate its identity for exactly the same reasons that any description of my own identity also fails. Um, no object fully instantiates the concept, um, or at least the concept doesn't describe the essence of any object. So, okay, I can take a tree as my property, but Stoner says, meanwhile, it doesn't escape you that what is yours is still itself its own at the same time, i.e. it has its own existence, it is the unique, the same as you. What is that object outside my window? It's nothing. But wait a minute, I can't appropriate nothing. I can't take nothing to be my property. Well, I mean, the thing to notice is I have created the tree by choosing a particular representation of the world. The concept tree is my concept and I apply it to various things. Uh, I am the creative nothing, the nothing out of which I myself create everything. Uh, so we must be careful with interpreting the notion of unique and its property. In saying that the unique appropriates various things, we might have in mind this ontology of independently existing things right, things with essences, but that's not the case. Um, on Stoner's view, all things are unique just as I am. That is, all things are nothing. So Stoner seems to be defending a pretty radical constructivism about the world. There are no independent objects. We bring objects into existence in how we choose to represent or carve up the world in the way that we choose to use concepts. And in fact, Stoner is explicit about the uh, about these, these anti-realist or constructivist commitments. Uh, even truth is not independent of us. Traditionally, of course, the view is that there are mind-independent truths. There is a way the world is, independently of me, and the point of inquiry is to discover these independent truths about the world. I ought to hold true beliefs and to make inferences in accordance with the rules of rationality. Of course, different people will have different methods for arriving at the truth. The dogmatist will be content to be told the truth by some authority figure, maybe a religious leader, maybe a scientific expert. The free thinker will seek the truth for herself. She will apply her own powers of observation and reasoning to come to her conclusions. In both cases, the truth is viewed as an independent ideal to which the individual must conform. And this is to say, of course, that the truth is not my own. The truth is independent. Stoner rejects this. Uh, there is no independent truth to which we might conform or fail to conform. Uh, he makes a couple of points here. So consider how it is that 
attributions of truth or falsehood actually occur, right? Like in practice, we have various thoughts and some of these we designate as true, some of these we designate as false. On what basis do we do this? Well, one point is that whenever people engage in any kind of analysis of an idea, in any evaluation of an idea, a criterion of criticism must be posited. I must make certain presuppositions, I must take certain things for granted for an evaluation of an idea to even get started, right? Like I can't even begin evaluating things um, until I have specified what I regard as reliable sources of evidence, uh, or you know what I take the logical rules to be, or what I take to be the values that I want to promote in my thought and action. Generally, people will simply take for granted the conventions of their culture. Um, so, you know, I'm going to assume that perception is reliable, that certain logical argument forms are truth-preserving, um, that the value of liberty is worth promoting, whatever. <clears throat> But the key thing here is that any presupposition I make is ultimately up to me. Um, it's, not, it's not given to me, it's a decision that I am making. Since I am unique, since I am nothing, uh, I am not like bound to any particular decision. I am free to give up any particular presupposition. So I'm not, since for instance, you know, rationality is not essential to me, I'm not compelled by anything to conform to the demands of any particular, you know, logical system, right? Like somebody says, okay, you know, this is the logical system that is truth preserving. I can accept that presupposition or I can reject it. But the point is, it's up to me. It's my decision. Second, um, Stjerner suggests a kind of projectivist account of truth. He says that what makes me judge a particular thought to be true is its effect on me. So when a thought overpowers me, when it inspires me, when it carries me away, uh, when it, when it, you know, pops out at me in the right kind of way, I designate it true. Um, so if you think about, you know, <laughs> things, things that sort of seem true to you and things that don't, right? The, the point is there's a difference in, you know, in the way that they affect you. Um, and that's what like leads you to designate them as true. Uh, and this leads to the sense that the truth is that which is not in my power. I feel impotent in the face of the truth. I feel compelled to conform my beliefs to certain ideas. Um, Stjerner says, by what do you measure and recognise the thought? By your impotence, by your being no longer able to make any successful assault on it. So I take the truth to be something external to me that is imposed on me. But notice that what's happened here. I'm designating particular ideas as true or false, depending on their effect on me. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm treating the truth as mind independent and impersonal, as something outside of me that I must seek, because of the way that certain thoughts impact my mind. But of course, if I'm classifying thoughts based on their impact on my mind, I'm not talking about something mind independent. Uh, it is, it is, you know, the way that I am affected that is leading to these judgments of truth or falsehood. Your, your impotence, Stjerner says, your impotence is their power, your humility, their exaltation, their truth, therefore, is you. Uh, Stjerner summarises this with uh, a, a lovely altered quote from Protagoras. Man is not the measure of all things, but I am this measure. So, so there you go. A, a pretty radical statement of, uh, of, you know, of relativism. It's, it's, not even, it's not even man that's the measure of all things. It's me. Uh, okay. So let's summarize. I exist through my activity executed through various things, right? Like the activity of thoughts and feelings, bodily movements, material objects that I've manipulated. And all of these things exist through me, through the constructive activity of, of me, of the unique. So we have it that the unique and its property are interdependent. Right, so, so like, yeah, the unique exists through its activity. That activity is executed with things, right? But those things exist through the unique. So we have this interdependence, interdependent existence. This is kind of analogous actually to um, Buddhist notions of emptiness. The way that Buddhism puts this is to say that all things are empty of intrinsic natures. All things exist interdependently with other things, with all other things. Um, so there's a lovely metaphor called uh, Indra's net, which is used to express this idea. Uh, Indra is a god who has a net that stretches out to infinity. At each node of the net, there's a jewel. 
If you were to examine one of these jewels, you would see reflected in its surface all other jewels. Moreover, each jewel you see in the reflection is itself reflecting all other jewels. So in, in that way, you know, you'd see the original jewel reflected in itself. But like with, with you know, each jewel, the kind of properties of each jewel, of the surface of each jewel, is produced by all of the other jewels. And so they're all kind of interpenetrating, interdependent in that way. Now, suppose you take the jewels to be analogous to things in the world. Each jewel reflects all others. By analogy, everything in the world interpenetrates everything else. The properties of one thing are determined by the properties of all other things. To understand one thing is to understand all other things. And that's the kind of relation you have between the unique and its property. Each exists together. The, the unique and its property are... <laughs> the unique and its property are the same thing and both are nothing. Um, and, you know, there are, there are sort of two points connected here. So the first is the ineffability or nothingness of the self. No concept applies to me. I exist only through things I appropriate or ways I act in the world. But then second, there's the ineffability or nothingness of all other things. It's not just that I am nothing, all my properties are also nothing. So, you know, so the attempt to identify essential properties of the self fails for two reasons. Okay, that is Stirner's view of the self. Now, this no doubt sounds rather strange, <laughs> um, but this is because people constantly engage in acts of self-deception. Self-deception, or what Stirner calls involuntary egoism, um, where a person, so in, in the case of involuntary egoism, a person serves himself, but because of confusion about the nature of the self, he thinks he serves a higher being. Okay, self-deception happens when we forget the uniqueness of the self, when we take ourselves to be defined by some essential property. And what's happening here is that concepts which we have constructed are assigned an independent existence or they're treated as powers to which individuals must be subordinated. The fundamental problem comes from the initial act of drawing a distinction between myself and the independent world, between me and the world outside of me. Stirner says, unselfishness is forgetting that the world is ours, of forgetting that one is the centre or owner of this world, that it is our property. In order to draw a distinction between myself and the world, I must define myself, right? I have to specify some thing, some self with properties, that is then presented in opposition to the exter external world. Like if I'm, if I'm drawing a distinction between two things, I have to specify what those two things are. So when I draw this distinction between myself and the world, right, I am defining myself. Uh, self and world are different, so each is attributed some essential property, some defining property. As a person grows up, uh, they, they have the desire to figure out the way the world works. And one thing that they will realise as they grow up is that they are not their body, right? That there's a distinction between their self and their body. So I think, okay, I act in the world through a body, but the body is not identical to me. You know, I could lose my body and still be me. Religious traditions have encouraged this with their notions of the afterlife. So I'm, maybe I take myself to be mind instead. I'm the entity that is behind the body, controlling the body. The mind exerts its control through powers of will and rationality. Uh, and I learn to control the bodily appetites, the desires and emotions. Um, you know, maybe sometimes I feel a desire to eat a chocolate cake, but then I overrule it. I engage in reason. I think, no, I want to be healthy, so I'm going to overrule that desire. So I have, um, you know, so I have this control exerted through reason. And so this this creates the, you know, what what this creates is the illusion that I am a rational mind. That this is my essence. I am a rational mind. And similarly, you know, we, we have this same, we, we attribute essences to all other things in the world as well. All things in the world have something behind them, some essential property that makes them what they are. Consider a claim like water is H2O. We don't see H2O. Instead, H2O is the reality behind the phenomena. It's the thing that makes water what it is. Essences lie behind the appearances. The essence of a thing is what is necessary and sufficient for being that thing. Now, of course, I recognise that as a mind, I have other properties. I have a body, for one thing. Uh, but these other properties are merely accidental. They don't, they're not 
part of what I essentially am. In the same way, water is essentially H2O, but a particular sample of water might have any number of accidental properties. Different samples might have different volumes, or they might have different temperatures, or you might, you know, add things to them, you know, add like food coloring to them, change their color, whatever. What makes them all water is that they share the essential property of H2O. I view myself the same way. I am a rational mind. I am identified with one of my properties. And then all of the other properties are merely accidental. They're not me. So having, having cleaved everything in two, having kind of drawn this line between self and the world, and then having defined myself in a particular way, well, I now have some, you know, I now have a role that I must perform and a set of norms by which I must live. So I can say, I am a rational mind, in which case, to fail to be rational is to make an error. You know, it's to be defective. Or I might say, I am a moral agent, in which case to fail to behave in accordance with moral norms is to make an error, it's to be defective. So my reasons for action and my standards of assessment are derived from these abstractions of rationality or morality or whatever else, which is to say I am subjugated to rationality or morality or whatever else. This is self-deception. I, um, I have kind of reified particular abstractions. I'm treating them as, a, as an ideal to which I must conform. I'm not, I'm not completely free, indefinable, indeterminate. No, I am a rational mind, or I am a moral agent, or I am a man. But as we've seen, uh, any attempt to describe the unique fails. The consequence of this is that when I do define myself, I'm, I'm going to come up short, right? I will be defective. Since nothing has an essence, nothing can perfectly instantiate any particular concept. I say that I'm a rational mind, but of course, sometimes I'm not rational. Sometimes, you know, sometimes I do other things. As a result of my individuality, I am a rational mind who is not truly a rational mind or is not fully a rational mind. Uh, Stirner suggests that this is expressed in religious notions of sin. Uh, all human beings are sinners which is to say they are defective in some way, they fail to perfectly inst instantiate uh, their humanity. The respects in which I fail to instantiate these essential properties are defects that must be overcome. So I'm rejecting the unique, as it were, in favour of the abstract concept. Stirner says, I separate myself into two halves, of which one, the unattained and to be fulfilled, is the true one. One stormily pursues his own self, the never attained, Okay, because since I'm unique, I can never fully overcome these defects. I can never be identified with the rational mind or the moral agent or the human being or anything else. And so I'm, I'm condemned to, uh, to eternal frustration, eternal, you know, defectiveness. Um, and what I have not realized here is that these, you know, these, these principles, these concepts are the result of the constructive and appropriative activity of my unique, of you know, the nothing <laughs> that is me. Um, in order to cleave the self and the world into two, the unique attempts to define its own nature. And it does this in terms of its own abstractions. It identifies itself with you know, these essential properties. And these abstractions then serve as independent ideals against which it judges itself. Uh, the interests of rationality, the interests of morality, the interests of mankind, the interests of God, uh, the unique projects these into the world and treats them as as external forces to which it must submit. Um, to define myself in terms of some essence, whether it whether this is in terms of rationality or morality or man or God or whatever, all of that is to ignore my uniqueness and the radical freedom that this involves. To recognize myself as unique is to return to nothing. Stirner says, if I base my affair on myself, the unique, then it stands on the transient, the mortal creator who consumes himself, and I may say, I have based my affair on nothing. Towards the end of his book, uh, Stirner elaborates on some of the consequences of this view of the self. Consider the, uh, the Christian, right, the person who believes that their essence is an immaterial soul that will be transported to an afterlife. The Christian, Stirner says, sees herself as fundamentally immaterial. And what that means is that she can lose all material things without giving up herself, without, you know, herself as a Christian, as an immaterial soul. And indeed, this is just what the Christian doctrine 
urges, right? It, it says, right, give up the material things of this world, or at least do not become attached to them. It's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. So give up those material attachments. The Christian acts egoistically towards material things. Um, but then, of course, she submits herself to abstractions or concepts like God, truth, rationality, mind. You know, in, in with respect to material things, right, she 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 is unconcerned, right? But with respect to God and morality and rationality, she has enslaved herself. And this is what people almost always do. They rebel against one thing only to substitute it for some other dogma. Uh, Stjerna says, after every vic after every victory after every victory over a faith, I again become the prisoner possessed of a faith which then takes my whole self anew into its service. So perhaps after giving up Christianity, I become a servant of reason and rationality, or I become a servant of humanity or something else. So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is to treat all concepts, all things, the way the Christian treats the material world. Then the unique can lose not just all material things, but it can also lose all of the thoughts that were dear to it, and yet it will remain itself. Um, so, the, you know, the person who does this, right, she will, uh, she will, she could lose everything and yet feel no loss to herself. To recognise that you are completely unique, that you are nothing, that is to give up all your attachments. Now, of course, in practice, I'm going to continue, you know, defending the things that are mine. I can, I can protect my material possessions, just as a Christian will protect her material possessions. I will protect my thoughts. I will argue for and against them. Um, but I'm not going to become attached to anything. I will not become a servant of anything. I could lose everything, all material things, all beliefs, all commitments, all feelings, all thoughts. None of that's a loss to me because none of that's essential to my identity. Um, it's worth uh, recalling a distinction I, I mean, I drew in a previous video between ordinary egoism and Stirner's egoism. In a colloquial sense, the term egoism refers to selfishness. Think of the avaricious man who is only interested in accumulating wealth and who will pursue wealth at all costs. He's never satisfied. He's always seeking out more money. And when he loses money, he experiences great suffering. This is a man who is like an addict. He has made himself a, a servant to material wealth. Everything he does is for the sake of this external power. Um, and, you know, so that's the kind of person who we might colloquially say he's egoistic or he's selfish because he's only concerned with himself. But actually, he's not only concerned with himself. He's concerned with money, you know, which he takes to be this external thing, this thing that he has to pursue. Um, now, of course, uh, you know, you might be interested in, in more than making money, but the majority of us we all like have countless attachments if not to money then maybe to humanity or to morality or to god or to intellectual development or to free thinking um all of these people the selfish man the, the moral man the religious man the truth seeker they're they're engaging in self-deception they have defined themselves and the world in opposition to each other and then made themselves a slave to some external thing say money or a moral ideal they have forgotten that nothing has value except insofar as we give it value, and to treat anything as being valuable in itself is to be made a slave to that thing. Um, even other philosophers of self-interest, uh, or, or what, you know, what are sometimes viewed as philosophers of self-interest, are engaging in self-deception in this kind of way. So think of the um, moral and psychological egoism of philosophers like Thomas Hobbes and Ayn Rand. They begin with descriptive claims about what human beings are and how human beings behave. So they begin by specifying the essential properties of human beings. And then on this basis, they impose rational constraints on action. They call it rational self-interest. People are required to conform to these independent rational norms and to promote the well-being of an entity, a self that is defined by certain essential properties. And that will involve forming attachments and defending them. For Hobbes, rational persons desire security. They want to, um, I mean, the, the main motivation, as Hobbes sees it, uh, is avoiding death, right? Like, that's what, that's what, that's fundamentally, that's the primary sort of motivation of, of the human being is to avoid death. And so we desire security and the pursuit of security requires accumulating power, accumulating wealth and material resources that can be used to defend oneself. The Hobbesian man 
forms attachments to his resources and he devotes his life to expanding and defending those resources. Stirnerite egoism, by contrast, can be viewed as involving a radical loss of attachment. Stirner says that for the egoist, everything is her property. But what exactly does that mean? What is it for something to be your property? Well, to make something my property is to take it into my power. But to take something into my power involves giving up my attachment to it. If I have an attachment to something, then I have subjugated myself to it. When I have an attachment to something, that thing has power over me rather than me having power over it. Uh, Stirner says, the thought is my own only when I have no misgiving about bringing it in danger of death every moment, when I do not have to fear its loss as a loss for me. So, you know, I, I, I can recognise that, like, in losing my hands, I've not lost myself. The loss of my hands is no loss for me. Uh, to, if I was to take that as a loss for me, I would, that, that would be to allow myself to be ruled by this external object. And as Stoner sees it, so it is for everything else, right? For the egoist, everything is her property, which is just to say that she has given up her attachment to everything. Stoner often talks of uh, acting egoistically against things, right? The, the Christian acts egoistically against material things. The individualist who has no respect for the nation acts, in, acts egoistically against the nation. The man who makes use of social privilege acts egoistically against equality. The man who controls others acts egoistically against the idea of liberty. The atheist acts egoistically against Christianity, etc. Acting egoistically against something need not involve explicitly fighting it, it's just a matter of having no concern for it, having no attachment to it, right? Like when I act as an individualist and I just don't care about the nation or tradition or anything like that, I'm acting egoistically. I may not be, uh, you know, I may not be actively rebelling against them, um, I just don't care about them. That is what it is to act egoistically. The egoist um, acts egoistically against everything. Um, uh, uh, she is not bound by anything. Uh, she has given up all her attachments. A great deal of dissatisfaction in life arises from what Stirner calls the strained relation between existence and calling, between me as I am and me as I should be. One way to think of this is in terms of standards and moral norms, right? Like if I, if I fail to worship God, then I'm failing to satisfy my greatest plan for me. If I fail to give to charity, then I'm failing to do what I morally ought to do. But of course, this, this point is more general than this. So I, I might compare myself to a Christian ideal or a moral ideal, and then I'm going to see myself as defective. Or I might compare myself to, you know, the man who has greater wealth. Uh, I, you know, so if I'm, if I'm an avaricious person who's only concerned with accumulating wealth, then I'm going to kind of compare myself to this ideal of a man with greater wealth. And again, I'm going to see myself as defective. Uh, there will always be more wealth to acquire. I'm never going to acquire all of the wealth. Um, the thought of, you know, and, and when I say like acquire, I mean, you know, like have it in a particular place, right, let's say. Um, there's always going to be sort of more value out there to find. So um, the thought of me as I should be, that arises when I fail to act egoistically, when I form an attachment to some object or ideal and I see myself as defective for failing to conform to it or failing to pursue it. But in fact, um, you know, this is, this is self-deception. In fact, we are, so Stirner says, we are perfect altogether. We are at every moment all that we can be and we never need be more. Since no defect cleaves to us, sin has no meaning either. Um, so what's the point here? Well, we are all we can be because we're nothing. We have no defect because we are nothing. And to act egoistically is to act as nothing. That's all. Thanks for watching.